Well, we're going to go slightly north of New York State and head up to, um, into Ontario. And our next speaker is Professor Christine Bays from the University of Guelph. Um, Christine holds a Can Canada Research Chair in Livestock Genomics and is a full professor in the Department of Animal Biosciences at the University of Guelph. She is also a scientist and a lecturer in the Vet Swiss Faculty, which I probably haven't quite got right, University of Bern in Switzerland. She is actually actively involved in a number of industry and stakeholder groups, including the Genetic Evaluation Board of Lactonet, the Breed Advisory Committee of Holstein Canada, the International Committee of Animal Recording, Feed and Gas Working Group, and the Genetic Monitoring Advisory Committee of the Swiss Federal Government. She is a steering committee member of the Dairy at Guelph, and she is a past president of the Canadian Society of Animal Science. Dr. Bayes and her team are interested in understanding the genomic architecture of livestock, novel phenotypes, and inbreeding in livestock. As a geneticist with a strong interest in animal behaviour, behavior. She's interested in developing sustainable breeding programs that incorporate health, welfare, productivity and efficiency. Her research involves using quantitative genetics and genomics, bioinformatics and statistics to better understand the genome and how it affects livestock. Together with her team of graduate students, postdoctoral researchers and collaborators, she applies these, the, these tools to large-scale breeding programs. In her spare time, which I'm not sure how much that actually is available, she runs a small fa farm in rural Ontario. So I'd like everyone to welcome Christine to our screens and to present on what is the future of genetic evaluation. Thank you, Christine, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. It's a shame that I can't be with you today. Uh, I hear it's pretty fun in Australia. I was actually in New Zealand two weeks ago for my niece's wedding, but I couldn't stick around long enough to, to come. So hopefully next time it works out, um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking to you today about sort of a research perspective from, from the Canadian viewpoint. And you can see there's a whole list of people on this first slide here. Oh, there we go. Uh, yep, you can see that there's a whole list of people on this on this slide here who have been um, really involved in, in a lot of the research that I'll present to you today. So the first question uh, to ask ourselves really, and, and we hear people talking about resiliency a lot, and I guess the, well, where we have to start is, is what is a resilient cow? And in our opinion, uh, a resilient cow should be able to adapt rapidly to changing conditions um, from a food security standpoint and in the context of the growing population. Those cows should also maintain good productivity, health and, and fertility. And of course, in the context of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and climate change, those animals should also become more resource efficient. But ultimately, they need to reduce their environmental burden. So. The definition of a resilient cow really incorporates a lot um, more than just uh, resiliency. When you really start to, to think about breaking that down, there's a lot of aspects there that need to be included. So as a researcher at the University of Guelph, uh, we do projects uh, a lot of the time. So one project that I'd like to introduce is uh, the Efficient Dairy Genome Project. And, and that was a project that ran from 2015 to 2020. And it was really a project, a Canadian project, that was set up to, to develop an international database for feed efficiency and methane emission data. Um, ultimately, what came out of that project were genomic evaluations for feed efficiency, and those were launched by Lactinet in 2021. But that's not the true beginning to, to the story, uh, the, to our story of, of feed efficiency and methane emissions, I think. Um, this started way back when, when Filippo Miglior was invited to be a, an external examiner for a PhD student in Europe named Helene Sawyert. She was looking at mirror data. Filippo got to thinking. He got involved in the GDMI projects from, from 2012 to 2014, which were really focused on aggregating international data on dry matter intake. So 
all of the efforts around feed efficiency and now methane emissions have really been sort of the collaborative international research group speaking with one another and pushing each other to to do more and to do better. But out of that, I think each individual country who's been involved in those conversations has tried to do their own. And of course, Australia, um, you guys have some pretty fantastic researchers down there um, who have pushed you ahead to, to, to introduce Feed Saved and, and all of the work that's being done there has really been contributing also to these international projects. One other thing that came out of the Efficient Dairy Genome Project was um, the, the contact to a, a commercial farmer in Canada who was actually crazy enough to install a whole lot of equipment in his barn. And you can see that uh, th this picture in the center of the screen now, this is a, a farm in Alberta um, that has installed 100 Incentec bins. This is a commercial farm, so we're still working out some, some kinks because these Incentec bins are normally installed in, in research herds, but this is just to show how, how much and how interested the industry is in, in really collecting a lot of data um, in Canada. So the Efficient Dairy Genome Project, it had uh, some partners. Uh, those partners were Australia, Denmark, Switzerland, and the USA. Uh, and it was such a it was so much fun that we decided to do a second follow-up project. And that's the Resilient Dairy Genome Project. It started in uh, 2021, I believe, and it will run uh, hopefully until 2024. And the, the goal of that project was really an expansion of the initial ideas that were put forward in the Efficient Genome Project. So in the Resilient Dairy Genome Project, you could tell we, we didn't want to spend much money on our logo, so we just kind of borrowed the one from the Efficient Dairy Genome Project. Um, but there, our goals were really to incorporate also fertility, health, and efficiency traits to have this overall resiliency index, um, which we're working on. And uh, hopefully, we'll have that. Um, that out in, in 2024 or 2025. But one main thing that has already come out of these two projects also is genomic evaluations for methane emissions, which are coming out in Canada in April of 2023. So we're really working hard in this space. And we've also got a few things on the go. Uh, we've got some, some funding in Alberta to install sniffer prototypes um, at Elora and on commercial farms. Uh, across Alberta. And we've also got a few more projects here under review to install really a lot of, of uh, methane intake data or methane output data across Canada. We've also got a, a large-scale genome project uh, in the pipeline, and I'll talk about that later on. But ultimately, the Resilient Dairy Genome Project has shown us that, the, um, that, that we're pretty strong nationally. Uh, we've got, you know, universities from the East Coast to the West Coast of, of Canada, uh, from, from Prince Edward Island all the way through to British Columbia. We've got researchers there in all different fields working together. Um, but what makes this project really fantastic are the, the international partnerships that we have. There are 42 organizations. I've just shown the research partners here, but there are 42 national and international organizations working together on this project. and. It has just been a fantastic experience. Uh, it's a little bit like herding cats sometimes, but most of the time things work. Um, and we're really excited because each of these countries has the autonomy to do their own projects, but we're also working together on our, on our shared vision of developing genetic evaluations for feed efficiency and methane emissions. So I'm going to talk to you now about the, the different activities within this Resilient Dairy Genome Project, because I think it gives a really good snapshot of where, uh, where Canada is going right now. So the first of the activities uh, in the project is focused on closer to biology fertility. This activity is being run by Dr. Ronaldo Seri. He's a reproductive physiologist at the University of British Columbia, and he's looking at how can we get information from standardized, uh, or how can we develop standardized phenotypes based on automated, automated sensors? So all those sensors that you guys were talking about yesterday, um, we can use them not only for management purposes, but if we can translate that information into sort of a standardized phenotype, we'll be a hell of a lot better off than using things like uh, a calving to first service, which 
we might as well be breeding the farmers as opposed to breeding the cows. So if we can get uh, a, a pretty good idea of how the cow is is biologically, we can uh, we can maybe improve our fertility traits. So we're looking at physiological factors affecting affecting estrus expression and embryo survival, um, as well as genomic markers of estrus expression and fertility. And here in the graph, you can see, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things that we can get out of this data, like the the inter-estrous intervals, the event timing of the first estrus, and as well the intensity of estrus. And those have been shown to be correlated to conception rates. Now, on top of this, we've also looked at a few other traits like uh, size and position score of the uterine tract itself. Um, Audrey Martin has done some work on that, a PhD student at the University of Guelph, where she's actually found heritabilities of around 10 to 12 uh, percent. And they are correlated as well with conception rate. So where the, the whole reproductive tract sits inside the cow has a has a relationship with conception rate. And as well, things additional work on transmission ratio distortion, which is how well an egg can accept um, a sperm given the gametes, that, so given the, the, the makeup of those two uh, components. So this is really, really exciting stuff um, that, we're, that we're working on here. Uh, at least I think it's exciting anyway. <laughs> so the next activity that I'd like to talk to you about is, is enhancing disease resistance. Now, Lactonet has already incorporated fertility disorders into their routine genomic analysis. That's things like metritis, cystic ovaries, et cetera. But we're currently working on seeing if we can use management data to actually develop novel evaluations. So we've seen that there's there's a lot of calves dying um, and, and there's different causes to those deaths, but, but a lot of them are caused, you know, calves who have diarrhea, they might die. Uh, 53% of calves actually, of calf deaths, mortalities are, are caused, either caused by or associated with uh, diarrhea. 21% are associated with respiratory problems. And then there's a few other ones. But we really wanted to see if we could use management data to develop an evaluation. And for calf health, that's work being done by PhD student Colin Lynch. We've seen heritabilities of between 4 and 10%. So we're really hoping that we can get those in incorporated into a, a national evaluation and that we can increase awareness that that, that data should be, should be recorded and should be really used. Uh, we've looked at leukosis. A uh, master's student, Renee Bongers, has done work on, on leuco leukosis and the genetics of leukosis. She came out just using the, the data that we have available with heritabilities of about 0.8, uh, or sorry, 8%. Uh, so so that's, pretty, that's pretty good as well. Um, Kyle Huxma is a master's student in our group. He's looking at the feed efficiency of calves, um, the metabolize the heritability of metabolizable energy intake. He's found that to be actually quite high. I mean, he's a master's student, so we've got to do a few additional analyses. But right now, it's looking at uh, it's looking at, at to be around 0.2, so 20 percent. Um, then we have also uh, Yoni's disease analysis. That's that's a tough nut to crack, but we're working on it. And as well, we're looking at the effects of homozygosity. So we're, we're looking at setting up a rapid reporting system for lethal recessives and malformed calves so that we can understand the genetic and genomic architecture of those, uh, of those malformations really quickly. And if they have a genetic component, we can get those bulls um, sorted out of, the, out of the pipeline quickly so that the uh, allele frequencies don't, don't, don't increase too fast. So we're also looking, of course, at feed efficiency and methane emissions. And I know Dr. Price spoke about this yesterday, and there were a few other discussions around methane and feed efficiency. Um, we're there too. We've got a goal uh, of enlarging our reference population to about 17,000 animals for feed efficiency and around 8,000 animals for, for methane emissions. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. And the interesting thing about this information is that it's coming from all different countries and it's being recorded different ways. And, and I think Dr. Price yesterday gave a fantastic overview of these different systems. So I'm not even going to get into it too much, but uh, we've got different countries with different diets and different systems. And it's really a challenge to get that information together, but it should all be the same thing. We should all be measuring methane emissions and we should be working towards a way to analyze that data together because no country can do it on their own. Another interesting thing when you compare countries here, you can see that 
well, you might not be able to see it, but on the x-axis here, we have days in milk. And on the y-axis, we have a uh, number of records. And what I want to show here is just the difference in pattern of collection across the, the participating countries. You can see uh, some like some countries like Denmark have a really uh, stable type of, of, of information collection over the course of the lactation, um, whereas Canada and Switzerland and Australia and the U.S. have sort of a more, we've focused on different parts of the lactation. But overall, we're all moving uh, towards the same goal. And I think that if we share our data, we're in a much better uh, spot than we would be if we were working alone. Activity four of the Resilient Dairy Genome Project is, is run by Dr. Flavio Schenkel at the University of Guelph. And he's really looking at bringing all of this information together. So he's looking at genetic parameters and predictions of, of breeding values of resilience traits, um, looking at genomic predictions, uh, looking at new types of, of genetic variation that we can incorporate here, and also investigating the effects of heat stress on the important traits. And I wanted to show a picture. So one thing that I thought was pretty cool was were some results from Kerry Houlihan, who was looking uh, across the, the lactation. So each one of these pixels, pixels is showing one week of lactation. And this graph just shows the correlations between weeks of lactation for a trait like dry matter intake. And you can see that Dry matter intake is quite dynamic over the course of the uh, of the lactation. Uh, there's too many things to mention here in this activity, so I just wrote down a few of the most recent publications that our students have been working on uh, across the just across the board. So fertility, looking at machine learning, hormonal synchronization protocols, um, reproductive tract size and position score or even uh, using these copy number variants uh, that are associated with fertility and disease. Then we have here the area of heat stress, um, incorporating NASA power information coming in uh, and using that to estimate and predict heat tolerance in Holsteins. Canada is a really cold country, but in the summer it gets pretty hot. And it, believe it or not, we do have heat stress, maybe not like you guys do, but it, it there are quite, uh, quite extreme temperature differences. Um, with regards to calf health, as I mentioned, we've got a few things uh, in the cooker here. We looked at uh, leukosis milk ELISA testing and uh, some genetic, we're developing these genetic evaluations for calf health. With regards to feed efficiency, there's been a lot of work done there as well. Um, in particular, uh, we looked at, at predicting methane emissions in Canadian Holsteins using mirror data. And Dr. Price uh, spoke a lot about that yesterday, and she's also a, a fantastic expert in that area, so you don't need me to tell you about that. Moving on, uh, activity five of the Resilient Dairy Genome Project is run by Dr. Mark andre Serard. He's got a tough time with us because he's kind of crazy. He uses, uh, he tries to find out which genes are turned on and which ones are turned off. So I don't really understand everything that he does, to be completely honest with you, but it sounds super cool. And the one graph that I could pick out from his work was this graph where he did whole genome by sulfite sequencing uh, of 24 healthy animals and 24 animals that had mastitis or poor performance or were infertile or were lame. And what he could see when he compared the methylation status of two different genes was that all the bad animals had, uh, uh, it was a really a, a systematic effect. Both of these genes were turned on at the same time and you could actually tell from that methylation pattern. So it's not just a, a question of whether or not the SNPs are there or the genes are there. It's also a question of whether or not they're turned on or off. So we're looking into that. And once I understand it, I'll get back to you and tell you more about his work. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Activity six is uh, run by Dr. Paul Stothard at the University of Alberta. He is managing our project database and he gets to play with all the cool sequence data. Um, he's also really heavily involved in this uh, whole genome bisulfide sequencing. And what we could tell from his work is that uh, ultimately from this very specialized type of sequence information, we can also get SNPs out of them. So that's also pretty hardcore stuff. But ultimately what we can see is that from, from his work, we can use uh, methylation sequencing and we can actually identify nuclear SNPs from his inf from that information. So that might be uh, really useful moving forward. We also have in the Genome Canada sort of program uh, 
of, of, of projects, we have to do a JALS component. And this JALS component stands for genomics. It's ethical, environmental, um, economical, legal, and societal aspects. So that's a mouthful. It took me a long time to figure out what that actually meant, but now I know so I can brag about it. Ultimately, what it's about here is sustainability and societal acceptance. So these people, Dr. Gaytu Hailu at the University of Guelph and Dr. Alan Goddard of the University of Alberta, they look at, at how people make decisions and how actually the public perceives our work in genomics um, and whether or not they see a benefit of genomic selection um, overall. And they came up with this kind of neat graph where it's, it's pretty hard to read, but we'll try and get through it. The blue bars here. So this is actually a graph of public perception benefits of genomic selection minus the risks of genomic selection. So in the middle, people are kind of indifferent. On the left-hand side, people think it's terrible. On the right-hand side, people think it's great. And what you can see is that the colors represent different years. So Ellen and Gaytu did a, a survey in 2012 asking people what they thought about genomic selection. And generally, what you can see from this graph is that as Ellen and Gaytu kept doing these, these surveys, so that the blue represents 2012, the orange is also in 2012, the gray is 2016, and the yellow, you can't see it, but it's 2020. Generally, the movement has, people have been more on the right-hand side of the graph, which is the positive side of things, uh, over the past decade, which overall I think is a pretty positive, positive thing. Um, so that's kind of cool. The next activity is, of course, no project is good without translation and implementation. So the, the folks at Lactonet, um, led by Dr. Garrett Kistemacher, are actually transferring and implementing um, these, these research results into actual national genetic evaluations. So we've got the, the fertility disorders done, Feed efficiency evaluations came out last year. We're expecting the methane evaluations in April, um, and we're working on developing this resiliency index that can be uh, that can be implemented hopefully soon. Um, so that's all super cool. But the overall aim, of course, is to select for cows that use feed uh, that use less feed at the same level of production and body size after the peak of lactation, because we do realize that these are uh, that these animals are needing some food at the beginning of their lactation while they're in negative energy balance. So the final remarks with regards to environmental efficiency is that our database is sizable and growing. We've got a lot of international partners. Uh, right now, we've got about 3,200 cows recorded for methane emissions. Uh, we'll soon be installing sniffers, uh, methane sniffers on uh, multiple commercial farms. Um, we can predict uh, methane pretty accurately using mirror information. And we've got a new Genome Canada proposal underway that I'm going to talk a few minutes about. Uh, we're trying to build a greenhouse gas roadmap using genetic and nutrition strategies, which is super difficult, but we're trying to get there. Uh, this roadmap will hopefully reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 54%. This is our star team of our new project. You can see there's a whole bunch of people involved. Um, and I'm really excited to work with them. One person here might be particularly of interest to you, and this is this fantastic woman right here, Chaley Richardson, who did spend a lot of time in Australia. So she's you can't have her all to yourselves, guys. We need her in, in Canada as well. Overall, um, our project is, is called Leveraging Genomics to Achieve Dairy Net Zero. It's got six activities. Uh, Really, it includes things like a life cycle analysis, genetic and genomic strategies, but also nutrition and management strategies. The super cool thing about the project is also that it plugs into a lot of other activities in this area. So we're not in a silo here. Um, geneticists can speak with other people sometimes if we have to, and we can also collaborate. So go, go us. Ultimately, we're leveraging genomics to achieve dairy net zero, and we've got some real deliverables here. Uh, besides the roadmap, which is the overall goal, we'd like to quantify the impact and uncertainty surrounding greenhouse gas mitigation strategies. We want to understand really the biological architecture uh, behind methane emissions. Uh, we'll produce some reports, but possibly more importantly, we've, we're trying to get to accurate and robust methods for measuring and estimating individual and herd level greenhouse gas emissions to be used in national policy and greenhouse gas inventories, because if those guys can't do their math right, we're screwed, basically. That 
my friends, is my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge all the funding agencies who have helped us, all of our partners, and as well the fantastic team of people who I work very closely with and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing such a wealth of information. Um, it's interesting, Krista, and you've um, triggered a question, but it's actually not a question for you, it's a question for the Australian industry from Paul um, Douglas's, are we spending enough in supporting phenotype, genotype research projects in Australia? So um, anyone who's got a checkbook out there that helps support these things, maybe that's a thought. So. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so thank you. So now any, and I do have a question coming from the floor. It's a, a certain uh, Professor Jenny Price, I believe. Hi, Chris. Fantastic talk. Uh -oh. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, really exciting to see you, all of the things that you're doing, all of the research areas and the potential breeding values that you've got that I think will really change the landscape in terms of breeding indices. I'm just wondering if you could give us a bit of a long-term view of how you think the weightings might change on traits, especially to achieve net zero and potentially with edible welfare concerns on top. You know. Yeah, fantastic question, Jenny. If I had a crystal ball, I would charge everybody lots of money to, uh, to have a look at it. But ultimately, this is this is really important, right? We've we've got um, we've got the opportunity now, but we're still not a hundred percent sure what these correlations are. So the first step is always develop develop the breeding value, then incorporate it into the national index. What those weights are are, I'm going to guess it's going to be relatively low at the start, just because that's the, the most safe way of going. Nobody's going to flip over production for methane emissions, but uh, it's going to be in there. And we're working on it. I don't think anybody has a real clear answer yet, but uh, we're doing the absolute best that we can right now uh, with the information available. I think everybody who's in the genetic space knows that methane feed efficiency we have to be very, very careful with these traits. We have to have a very good understanding of the metabolic disease that may be associated with pushing these animals too hard, in particular at the beginning of the lactation. That then becomes really, truly an animal welfare aspect. But at the same time, we're, our whole industry is under, is under pressure. We live in a world where we're not talking, where, where perceptions are more important than facts. And that's a fact that I don't like, but it's, I think where we're at. So we've got to do our best, but we've got to be careful. Thank you. I'm not sure whether you'll share um, this one with us, but I've had a question. Who and how did you convince investors to pay for expensive genotyping? <laughs> that is a totally separate story. That is a, a collective effort by the whole research group and the Genetic Evaluation Center over many, many years of separate piece together research projects. Um, we've been very, very fortunate in Canada to have an industry and a research group that has worked very well together over time, and also producers who have been willing to, to, to pony up and, and, and genotype their animals as well. I believe right now we've got about 100,000 cows genotyped in Canada, so that's, that's really fantastic, but we can, we can always do more. And we're going to keep pushing to do more. Okay, thank you. Well, I think um, that's about brought us to the end of questions I'd see from the floor. So once again, fantastic um, presentation to um, back up the, the, the previous one, and I think it's given us a tremendous insight into um, what's happening in Canada, but also the understanding of the, just the, the collaboration process that is, um, supports so much of this work. So if everyone would like to bring their hands together to thank Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Have a good evening.